Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Behind the Research, a segment of PT Meal Podcast in partnership with the Philippine Journal of Physical Therapy. In this segment, we will take a dive into the research and talk to authors of select articles published in a PHAPT. So in this episode, we will discuss the research entitled Designing a Conceptual Framework to Align Learning Objectives to the Interprofessional Education Collaborative Core Competencies, uh, a narrative review. I'm pleased to have in the show the authors of the article, Dr. Norman Belieza and Dr. Maureen Johnson, Assistant Professors from the University of St. Augustine for Health Sciences for PT and OT programs, respectively. Welcome, Dr. Belieza and Dr. Johnson. Thank you for having us. Glad to have you here. So also joining the conversation or as a reactor and share is Assistant Professor Giselle Regino from the University of Santo Tomas and one of the managing editors of the Philippine Journal of Physical Therapy. Welcome, Giselle, to the podcast. Um, so I'm looking forward to our conversation uh, uh, today. So what was interesting for me in, in reading uh, this article was um, talking about um, interprofessional education because when I was in um, when I was a student not not long ago, uh, the uh, talking about other professions were just you just pass through it like it would be mentioned that physical therapists work with other professionals like doctors, nurses, occupational therapists, speech language pathologists. So it wasn't uh, a thing to integrate what they can put in the table or what they do as uh, in relation to what physical therapists do and, and learning about IPE is uh, when when we when two or more professions learn with, from, and about one another uh, would create an effective collaboration, which was part of your, um, our, uh, your research. And the collaboration part is working with those professionals as well as patients, family, and communities as compared to to what I've learned, which is from a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary model where people where professionals are just working, you know, with you know, with their profession, taking care of a patient, and that's it. And in the Philippine setting, it's with with the doctor heading that team and and just getting inputs to take care of the patient. So this is interesting for me to to read about. So to start with, um, so that our audience would have a, an idea what we're going to be talking about, could you give us um, a brief overview or summary of what the research is all about without going into too much detail? Yes. Oh, thank you, Johan. I, my, my experience was very similar to you as well. Uh, when I went to PT school, uh, we did actually have classes with OT students and other professions, nursing students, etc. But we were just sitting side by side and not, not that real, like you said, collaboration or learning about and with and from each other. So uh, that, that's the, a really key piece that I think is kind of the crux of the research that uh, Dr. Johnson and I were interested in is really finding best practice and knowing that interprofessional is defined as um, learning from, with, and about the other discipline and not just being side by side and counting that as interprofessional. And you're, I, you're, I think that multidisciplinary would represent how we do things currently, but interprofessional is really collaboratively working. And then there's also that higher level of transdisciplinary care. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Johnson has a lot of ex has had, had experience there, but our research was really looking at that opportunity. We have had a course where we were OTPT, and we were just kind of learning with each other, but not about and from. Uh, and so we wanted to find best practice. So we, as we were looking at learning about each other's roles and responsibilities, and how do we do teamwork and how do we communicate more effectively. We wanted to look at the evidence of interprofessional education. Uh, Dr. Johnson and I both attended a conference uh, when we both started in simulation, uh, the International Meeting for Simulation Healthcare in Orlando, Florida. Dr. Johnson, was that 2017 or 2016? And 2017, it's when we learned about IPE. And so that's when we started like, hey, let's start really aligning more, look at best evidence. And that's what led us to this narrative review of finding how to make sure we're doing best practice. Um, so, uh, Dr. Johnson, can you give us a 
uh, the reason or context probably behind why you chose interprofessional education collaborative care as a topic of for for a research or for your study you know it's we dr Baez and i have been teaching together since 2014 in a class and we had combined occupational therapy and physical therapy students and as dr Baez said they were just literally sitting next to each other almost like parallel play and you could feel a little bit of hierarchy and some drama sometimes with the different disciplines because it wasn't interprofessional. It was just being taught the, you know, patient care management, transfers, walking, things like that at the same time. And after we went to that conference, we really recognized in ourselves that maybe we had assumptions about each other and each other's profession that were unspoken. We didn't really think about it until we went to this conference. And then we went the following year, actually we've gone every year since. But what we've learned is we almost had to disband our own premonition of what the other profession does and learn from each other first before we could even start thinking about how we're going to have the students learn with each other and to each other and teach it with each other. So that was really interesting to me and what I learned. And so, you know, doing a narrative review just seemed like the perfect start for us because when we were looking and even attending these conferences, it was mostly medical. So we're talking nurses, doctors, um, anesthesiologists, pharmacists, really had little to none occupational therapy and physical therapy back in 2016, 2017. And then, and we were like unique that we were there and we had so many questions and they're like, who, who are you guys again? <laughs> who are you guys again? We're like, we're the ones in the ICU, like walking the patients, get the patients up. Like, oh yeah. They never even thought to include us in their IPE, even with ICU. And so a lot of our conversations there were like, wow, that's just so interesting because they don't think of us as team players. They're, we're just OTPT, uh -huh. it, which is very interesting that we learned about. So doing the narrative review, we really took that moment to scour the literature and find what is out there, who's doing what, and it really wasn't much for occupational therapy and physical therapy. Mm -hmm. So That's really that's interesting it. to know, um, given that physical therapists work all around the hospital and, mm -hmm. and no one ever thought of uh, mm -mm including physical therapy or occupational therapy mm -hmm. and the team that, you know, probably you're, you're just there, PT, OD, you're just there, we see you, but <laughs> no one even bothered to invite them. Mm -hmm. I'll, yeah, I'll many also add that just even with myself working with Dr. Johnson, you know, we, we're, we're all clinicians. We, we provide physical therapy, OT, OT care. So we have, like she said, assumptions or biases, but I learned so much sitting next to her as we wrote these. I, that now that even going through this process now had a much more deeper appreciation of OT and the lens and the perspective and how they mm -hmm. see the patient and years of being a clinician and being in education. It really was us working together on this model and these activities that really helped us understand each other. We still learn from each other. Like, Oh, that's how you see it. Or that's how you're thinking it. And so mm -hmm. I think that's the beauty of interprofessional education of learning about your own role, but also the role of others, which we call the dual identity. I think it's, it's a really powerful testament when you're making these interprofessional activities, you have to have the disciplines present. So you can't pretend someone's a nurse. You've got to have the nursing person there. You can't make assumptions because that's where the stereotypes and the biases start to come in. Mm -hmm. And to complement that is it was a little vulnerable because there are a couple of times when I think both of our little feathers were getting ruffled and a little defensive about our professions. And, you know, we were recognizing that like, Oh, wow. Okay. So we have our own bias. Like, and you know, Dr. Blaze and I worked together for so long and started this journey together and even knowing each other for so long, we, they all came out and we're like, Oh, mm, you know, so things like that. And just, just being vulnerable and open and and kind of let suspending our bias and going tell me more right you take that moment like even you johan you said that you work in a psych facility and i you know in my in my pts are in there mm. ot's have been in there for a long time but mm. pts are in there so mm. that's really interesting and because that's a bias of mine I, oh i didn't know pts were in psych wards mm -hmm. so i know in a floor but not like in a freestanding facility so there, right. Every day we learn something and we've been 
clinicians for decades, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so um, it was mentioned in, in the in, in in your study that um, most of the IP experiences uh, are are single events. Uh, why do you think that that is so? I think what we're what we are understanding sometimes it, it is a challenge for one mm -hmm. it was just the resources the time the, to get all the disciplines together and so they they want to do this what we what i see is a, a grand event a big ip event let's get 600 people in a room we're going to talk about this case and we're going to all kind of do a maybe a smaller group discussion on it and then we check the box it's like mm -hmm. we did an ipe and i i like to and, and I, i'm not to say that's of less i think it's just the constraints this mm -hmm. this is one time that we could do it as a university but i feel like you're only kind of scratching the surface like kind of i call it ipe light or appetizers you're not getting into the full main course of really getting in, into the meal and really uh, taking a deep dive into it so i think that's one of the limitations uh is just that, that time constraint even with Dr. Jaws and I just finding the time or for other courses. Where do we get the the disciplines in? When? What time do we have? And so, and then uh, working through those challenges. And then everyone is very protective of their course time. I've got this many weeks. I've got a two hour lab. I can't give that time up because you know they don't see the value in it. You, you know that they, they have to get that buy in. You have to show them. So I think those are some of the reasons. I don't know. And turn it to Dr. Johnson if there's any other. Thoughts well, on that? Yeah, Dr. Blaze and I were very early adopters. You know, they mm -hmm. said they were building a sim center at our university, and we were on board right away, mm -hmm. going, this is going to be fun, more realistic, more authentic. And then that's when we really started to get into the IPE and recognizing that it's with time and experience that we learn our comfort zones. And so a one-off event is, yeah, it's a you know, it's like a concert. You go and you're done, right? Mm -hmm. But time and experience and repetition, that's when we start really pushing our boundaries and learning about the other profession and asking questions and, and learning and being open about it. And so we really felt the value of in our one 15 week course that we had it not even at one time for events, but spread out over the course. Mm -hmm. So they are learning independently and then they deliberately come together for these IPE events and really cherish those moments, right? And being with the other profession and learning about them. And it's really changed how the students started behaving towards each other. Mm -hmm. It changed their physical skills for transferring, which makes no sense to us because the, it, uh, what were our, our activities didn't really, really require too much of that. But I think just because they knew they had confidence in another person with them, from another profession and they're doing it as a team that it, it was almost like you're looking at a real therapy session, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just students in a simulation. Mm -hmm. So I think the culmination of it all um, has made a change. Mm -hmm. And as, as you did that in your, in, in your uh, programs with uh, one time for each term, correct? Um, did you notice any difference from when they started in that first first a uh, go at it activity and to the, the last activity? Did you notice any difference uh, in how they approach each other, how they approach an activity? Yes. So the we have four different IPE experiences through the 15-week course, mm -hmm. and each one is designated to one of the core competency domains. Mm -hmm. So the first time... The uh, physical therapists come in and sit in a group of physical therapists and the occupational therapists come in and sit in a group of occupational therapists. Oh. And then in we, and the first one is just about roles and responsibility. It's actually really fun. It's a, a scavenger hunt with an escape room and we oh. pair them up into OT and PT groups. So then they start meeting each other, getting comfortable with the other profession. And then halfway through the term, we come together again for a, a simulated chart they're doing a chart review for a simulation with an SP and they're so they're reading the chart together for the patient that they're going to go in and do a therapy session. Mm -hmm. And then again, they come in, they sit in their individual professions, but by the last one, they come in and they just sit all over around and, you know, talking with they're intermixed. Uh -huh. So their comfort level with each other and seeing how teams work and, you know, Dr. Blaze and I are always there together 
So they also were role modeling that as well. And I think that's made a difference. I also remember the <laughs> uh, early on when we first started the model, that was another interesting comparing when we started our IP activities mm -hmm. uh, the first few terms or first few years now that it's, we've been doing this for several years and then thinking now that we're doing it in the latter. I remember when we first started, there were like, Dr. Johnson said there are some turf wars and we heard some conversations that the students have had like, oh, is that a real profession or is that is this real therapy? Are you really scientific or we're more scientific and oh, we have this degree and you have that degree. And we were very interesting for, for us. Like we didn't model that as faculty. Where are they bringing these biases or these preconceptions or these conversations? And it might be just their own or that's what they have seen and in prior clinical experience, we're not sure. So we really wanted to make sure that the way we present and the, the learning activities that we have, that we're really bringing each other, at, you know, we're both here, not in one here or here. And so we all, even when we debrief our activities or simulations, we talk about if you're up here and your colleague is down here, you should bring yourself down or try to bring your colleague up so that you're interprofessional. There's no hierarchical thing. So we, we were really sensitive to that. And even student feedback, like uh, just the way that I would address the, the cohort or the group, just saying, you know, making sure that it's not, it's inclusive, it's inviting to all. So we had to be very cognizant of that because there's just a lot of protective uh, conceptions from students. And so we were really, uh, deliberate and purposeful in that and, and now I, I ever since we've been doing it we haven't had those issues we haven't heard those side conversations anymore because i think the the culture i think has shifted where we have ot and pt really much more collaborative and i i, I feel like it's a strong testament to our faculty and our our efforts to to really uh, be appreciative of each, each other's disciplines Gotcha. I'd like to ask um, um, Giselle now, uh, what's your experience with IPE is in your university? Is it a, a single event or is it similar to uh, Dr. Biez's and Dr. Johnson's um, uh, multi-part uh, activities? Okay, so we started the IP. I think in the Philippines, it's already it's only an emerging, uh, um, emerging topic of the IPA, and we started to formulate it and part be part of the curriculum when we shifted to a new education system in the tertiary level. Okay, because one of the program outcomes in all health science programs uh, included there is the interprofessional collaboration. And how we will be able to produce that kind of outcome is in order for you to integrate the IPEC competencies. Okay, the four IPEC uh, competencies. Uh, we started with a four-year four-year program, four-year uh, level or four-year plan. We started with the first cohort, which is the first year. We introduced first the concept, a one-day activity for all the first year, for all the four courses. We have four courses in our college. As I mentioned, we have the PT, the OT, the speech, and the sports science. Uh, we started with a half-day activity to provide them teamwork, communication, getting to know each other. Just, just the initiation of the of their first year. Come on second year, we integrate the IPE in their research in all the in all the in all in all programs. And then in third year, we already introduced the course. It's an IPE course uh, offered in a one term. I think it's also a 15 week course. 15 week course and uh we have three modules. We first is we wanted to provide them the knowledge on the concepts of the IPEC IPEC competencies because we all know that each program have their own uh, professional skills. Uh, their professional courses provide them their enhancement and cultivations of their professional skills in the IPE. We cultivate their 
soft skills, we cultivate the IPEC competence. That's the most important thing that we embed. And we wanted to meet the course outcomes. And then, as I mentioned, I wanted also to react on your articles. It's very nice because it really provides us this narrative review, the importance of in, of integrating the IPE in the curriculum because it mentioned here that uh, it improved the communication, a better sense of status for each of the discipline because after the one term, uh, we already uh, had good feedback from our students. Imagine we have uh, three, uh, we have, I think, 300 students composed of the PTOT speech and sports science. The logistic part is the most difficult part in order for them to have a one, a three hour class in a week. All of them mixed together. We combine, we produce one in one group, different mixed variety of students. And then we incorporate the teaching learning strategy. Okay, we also provide, I, I, I read in the article, some of the teaching learning strategy, and I'm so interested in the simulation you did in your college, because here in the Philippines, you always use hypothetical case, role playing, um, service learning. Um, we, we initiated the course year 2020. Imagine that's the peak time of the pandemic and our vision there is to provide a community-based rehabilitation and immersion to the community. However, because of the restriction, we need to innovate and to provide a teaching learning strategy that would somehow align with the course outcome. And we try to do the virtual the virtual community-based rehabilitation in order for our students to be able to experience and be able to improve the IPEC competencies. Okay, and I, I think this one, because we are now transitioning already into the face-to-face -face, uh, this year, this, this term, so we will be also again changing. We're already on the stage of planning and changing the teaching teaching learning strategy so that we will be able to provide our student a better, a good experience and appropriate teaching learning strategy for them in order to meet the outcome of the said course. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, in the Philippines, they I think they, they have just started to do in-person classes uh, yes. this year. Uh, they had a, a, a long um long uh what do you call this uh online type of learning before they were allowed to go back to schools for in-person uh uh lectures um going back to um the the article uh, of all of all the results that you found of the be best practices uh in your review which ones uh are, are do you think are most effective based on your uh, experiences. Thank you for that question. It's, it's a, as you look for what is going to be the most appropriate learning activity, right. one higher than the other, yeah. I think you it really just, uh, you can't say one is more desired than the other. It really, I think what our narrative review and our conceptual framework really helps us understand is it really depends on what your goal is, especially if you're looking uh, like, uh, like uh, Dr. Regino was saying, was uh, the um, if you're looking at the IPC core competency domains, if it's values ethics, what is going to be the best venue for you to showcase the learning activity that matches to whatever sub competency you're going to want to align to? So it could be a simulation. It mm -hmm. could be like if we're doing teamwork, the scavenger hunt worked really well. Uh, the working together to figure things out, the decode words and learn about each other's professions and all these tools and such. A uh, communication, it could be, you know, it could be a role play. It could be a simulation. It could be now, I, I love this the topic about the virtual, you know, we can still do telehealth. We can still do virtual communication and conferencing that way. So um, that's really what I think is important is aligning the learning activity with the outcome, with the core competency domain, having that curricular alignment is key. And so that's what will help you know if the learning activity is appropriate or good or 
not good. I'm really excited about in the Philippines now that you're shifting, I'm already thinking research. Okay, let's look at the outcomes of your virtual and your tele, uh, online learning and your community health experiences and then compare that to the face-to-face. -face. So I see a lot of re really exciting research that you all will come up with uh, as you're emerging from the pandemic teaching. Right. Do you have anything uh, to add, Dr. Dr. Johnson? Yeah, you know, we when we were looking at all the, you know, satisfying the institutional learning outcomes, the program learning outcomes, the course learning outcomes, and the core competency domains, we also wanted a variety to just to keep the interest of the students. Mm -hmm. And so even when we were COVID, we didn't stop. We we shifted everything virtually and we recognized that when it was time for our values and ethics uh, simulation. You know, of course, we're not on campus. We wanted to do something spicy to keep their attention. And so we wrote a medical legal simulation for occupational therapy and physical therapy supervisors who signed off on notes. And then the family a year later is suing the hospital and it goes back to the supervisors because the students are gone. And we invited all the students to come to the sim because everyone was kind of over being online. R you know, now we're like, oh, I kind of like it online. And then maybe I want this in person. And now we have a variety. But back then when we did that spicy sim, the students had their shirts and they were staring at the screen the whole time because we had a big Teletron and we could see it. And they were so invested. And we're like, that's it because we, we brought in a lawyer to sue us in front of the students. So oh. we, we were deposed in front yeah. of the students yeah. and we didn't know the questions the lawyer would ask. Mm -mm. So she was firing at us for 10 minutes. Just like a lawyer defending it. And we we're, I, I guess we were sinking in our seats like, ah, you know, cause we were, even though we wrote this then, <laughs> but it, it was very scary, but it was very realistic and authentic. Uh -huh. And so there's still stuff we can do online if we want to. And like uh, Dr. Laiza said, it'll be really interesting to see studies of maybe if you're doing SPICE R2 or whatever data you're collecting or assessments you're collecting from the students pre and post COVID, you know, or face-to-face -face versus virtual. That's a lovely study, you know, with your different ones. Right. And I'll just, and just to tag up on that as well, on top of just the IPEC core competency city mains and the learning activity. You also have to think of the level of the student because I think Dr. Regino was talking about fourth term, fourth year versus third year versus first year. So now you're thinking of hierarchical learning, which is introductory level, you know, kind of uh, getting them used to it, application, and then competency, right? So you have to think about that too. So really, for our first term students. <laughs> the the medical legal system was a little too intense for them because it was they were terrified and it's so <laughs> we, we feel that we want to push that for later terms but you also have as you're making curricular design and IPE you have to think about the type of learner and where they're at on top of all the uh, the other considerations as well mm -hmm. one of our sims is actually having a patient in the room with a confederate nurse coming in as well as a distracting family member and you're know, talking about communication, professional communication, mm -hmm. verbal and nonverbal between the students and then the family member, the nurse and this, this migrant of things, but writing the, and then we came up with the idea, let's write a chart. And so we wrote a whole simulated legal medical chart that they had to go through. And we didn't recognize that they've never opened a chart before. Mm. Right. So there's so much learning just from that where, they're going to the surgical notes and finding all these things, never even thought to look for orders. Like, are you allowed to even read anymore in the chart? Like, so that opened up again, first term versus fourth term, they would have already known that. So, you know, learning along the way, but it was still very fun to watch them go through a chart because they're right. like, oh, there's x-rays and. Right. You know. And those things I just experienced when I started working, the, it, it's good for as a student to know about that early on and be at least familiar of what to look for. Uh, uh, do you have anything to to share, uh, Giselle? I think one also the most important in 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 the article that highlighted is the importance of training the trainer for improving the educator 
competence because i think in in the in the institution of norman and doc and and doc maureen is that they do simulation so the educator or the teacher or the faculty member should be competent enough in order to deliver the the appropriate uh, content and the teaching learning strategy because um I in in our in our institution uh, limited limited knowledge and the competency of what is IPE is all about. They always they, they always tell us that this these activities and IPEC, but unfortunately they are working on their own silos. There's just not only a group of different healthcare professionals, but they're working silos. They're not they're not um they're not exhibiting communication they are not exhibiting the, the shared responsibility the shared goal the teamwork or knowing the roles and responsibility of each of the participants i think the most important when we start this program is we really need to identify the faculty or the academic staff who will be part of this program and then train them to be more competent and then and then later on, we will be training other academic staff in order to increase the number of uh, faculty members, aside from teaching our students in doing in in, 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 in honing their IPEC uh, level. And I do agree also with Dr. Maureen that the, 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 the characteristic of the learner is very important in designing the teaching learning study, like the case that you provide certain cases in your teaching learning, you have to make sure that the students in that level already have this uh, capacity or competency in some of the medical surgical conditions and also their professional skills in handling that kind of conditions. I, just, I wanted to add, there's so many good things that was just said there. Um, it's what I think is really what we can appreciate from this, if, uh, you know, treating in the Philippines, United States, or anywhere in the world, or OTPT, the the challenges we all face are still the same silos and you know working you know blinders on and i think it just it just resonates so well from this podcast that we can see that we all have these challenges no matter what um but i the faculty training is key uh, dr johnson and i have heard this and we should if we have anything that comes from this podcast it would be that uh, uh a bad ipe is worse than no IPE. So if you have a really bad experience, you can really just destroy, you can really have cause harm to student learning. So that's really important that we have good training and that we uh, foster best practice because we don't want our students to have a negative experience from the IPE of the event. Dr. Beleza and I went to uh, train the trainer of conference out of University of Virginia and really learned how to teach faculty. And, you know, with that being said, there are faculty who are excited to learn something new and there are faculty who are just fine and they don't want to learn anything new and change anything. And so we were tasked because we went to this conference to come back and do a five part training series online so no one had an excuse that they couldn't be there so it was a virtual um every month we had a session for an hour and it was to teach overall the four core competencies and then individual ones and we used the approach of they were the student so we included them in learning and again it's still sometimes so hard to start getting them ignited and excited about i because mm -hmm. they just really have no interest. Yeah. I, may add, I think they also have a false conception on the similarity. Uh, they know that the uh, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary is the same as the IPEC approach. It's different. So we have to provide them a good knowledge and information about this uh, two terms because they I think the practice itself is multidisciplinary and we wanted it to shift in the IPC, IPEC approach. We also came across a lot of, you know, after we trained, we had five different uh, sessions and then we gave them worksheets and how to do it step-by-step -step guidelines. And some of them started and then took a lot of shortcuts so they didn't follow the true nature of IPE. So it was 
one discipline, just designing it and trying to have a student step in to be the role. So it was like, oh, no, you got to start together and finish together, you know, the whole process there. And, you know, it's just been really um interesting seeing the variety of faculty that we have on our campuses you know mm -hmm. so even the the training part of of the ipec for the the facilitators and the faculty is in, interprofessional all of them are together and not just <laughs> we'll train physical therapists we'll train occupational therapists we'll train pharmacists mm -hmm. all of them should be together as well experiencing at the same time got it um so go back to to uh, the 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 article your your research. You also designed a conceptual framework uh, for uh, integrating the I IPEC uh, to to curriculum. So how do you think the the conceptual framework may assist um, uh, academicians in in or, or faculty in in creating or designing their their curriculum? Thank you. I think yeah, that I think that was kind of the culminating piece of our. Mm -hmm article is really just what, what is the take home? There's still a lot of evidence out there and there's a lot of, it's like not, it's not so regimented, right? There's a lot of nuance of what's the best learning activity for the type of thing you want to do for your, your competency domain. So I think really kind of, I think the, the crux of this is really having that, the backwards design really helped us kind of guide this process. I think that's important. So starting with the end in mind first, which is your your institutional learning outcome. And our our university has adopted IPE or interprofessional collaboration by creating an, an institutional learning outcome of apply interprofessional competency. So there the buy-in at the leadership level is there. And then how does that thread all the way down through your accreditation standard? All of our disciplines, OTPT, nursing speech, SLP, uh, in the Philippines, United States, I think they're all of our accreditors are valuing collaboration or interprofessionalism. So I think we have that there. And so looking at those, I think most places are adopting the IPEC core competencies. Those are the kind of the, big, our research shows that it's kind of the gold standard. So we, when we start talking, we all know what the core competency domains are of ethics and communication and teamwork and roles and responsibilities. So aligning with that and I think the key there is also that we found is that you can't hit everything at one time. So that's what we've learned is you, when you start doing a sim, you start to like, oh, let's throw this in. And then when the patient does this, we're going to have this emergency happen. And then the family member is going to come in and collapse and fall and have a, it's just like you start to just snowball and it turns into a disaster because you're trying to do too much. So you got to be true to what you want to get out of it because everything else can be another IPE later. So just really keep it simple. Dr. Mo and I are through the research we found that at 15, 20 minutes, but also through our own experience, we're finding an event should be just around that time. When you start to get 20, 30 minutes, the students are not able to keep up with it. And that the best practice, and I've seen we've seen some of our some things go too long and it's just it's not very fruitful for for learning. And so and then like finding all the outcome measures, their self-rating, uh, where students self-rate their attitudes or their, their own skills. Uh, preceptor, where me as a faculty looks at the student and rates that. So there's uh, various outcomes out there and just making sure that that outcome is really good for the learning activity. So if you're doing a sim or a case conference or this large IP event uh, that the, in the Philippines that they're doing, having the right outcome measure to align with that learning activity, I think that's kind of the I think this framework helps us stay aligned and helps us check all the boxes to have a meaningful IPE event, but also uh, making sure that it, all of your objectives and outcomes are, are being met from the activity. To go along with that, I, I wish we spent more time on debriefing as well, because if we're doing a simulation, the style and technique of debriefing we have found has been very important. So where it used to be one would do one debriefing and one would do the other debriefing if we ran a couple sims in one day. We now are together and we co-debrief mm -hmm. the whole crew. And that's made a difference because we can feed off of each other. Like while one's speaking, the other one can be thinking about the next thing. And what we really had to learn, which was probably the hardest part as faculty is to zip it. 
and have, have those open-ended questions and letting the students go through that awkward silence. It takes them about five seconds and then someone has to break the ice. Usually faculty saves the air and usually faculty will kick in. So Norman and I have learned to zip it, ask the question and then wait for it and, with a smile on our face. Count, count one, two, two three. And, and then, and then a student will jump in. Yes. <laughs> and and then we're actually talking about what they want to talk about, which was another thing that we really learned and appreciated that, you know, when we teach something, we already know in our mind what we want them to take home. If we give them the arena to speak, they're actually telling us what they observed and maybe something that's not settled with them and that we can explore it more. You know, um, one of our Sims has a family member in the, a person in the room, and they just go right in and start doing therapy without asking permission. Can I start therapy with you with this person in the room? You know, or do we need to have ask them to leave? Like, well, there's that assumption that it's a family member where it's not, mm -hmm. right? And you can't. That's you know HIPAA requirements and stuff like that. So that unsettles a lot of our students, and they just want to talk more about that. So, what does that really mean? Because they're first term students, they they really don't know. And a lot of their experience has been in gyms or in schools, not so much in a hospital setting where there's privacy and confidentiality. Mm -hmm. And and but so learning to zip it and let them speak, you know, we try to have the students speak probably would you say like 70% of the time, and we're only 30%, if that. That's very hard to do as faculty. Right. shift away from lecture yeah and just let it be a debrief that's a it's a very different learning environment for sure mm -hmm. um i i do want to also add that the conceptual framework was just a part of what we got from our narrative view i think dr donson mentioned it earlier we've been talking about the model like uh, you, we talked about a one-off with a simulation or ip event but what we have is we're excited to share that we are working on a pilot a manuscript to talk about the effectiveness of this model or this conceptual framework and IPE model that has the four activities. And so that is upcoming and we're hoping to have that together soon. So All right. we're looking forward to reading more about that. Uh, do you have anything to add uh, just out to, you know, what, you know, how the um, conceptual framework would uh, help in curriculum um, uh, formulation? Yeah, I think the, the one that they formulate is really a very good uh, conceptual framework uh, as a reference for institutions who will be uh, initiating or improving the IPE as part of the curriculum. Uh, I think it all, they also mentioned uh, many outcome measure tools uh, in the narrative review that will be very beneficial because at the end of the, the course, we wanted to check, we wanted to know the effectiveness of the of the course that we wanted to, to implement to our students, not only on the grades that they are all passed, but actually the effectiveness of the whole course itself. And I'm really happy because the, the, it mentioned they're all a majority or and a majority or important outcome measure tool needed for the, the course itself because um, we are planning also to have a research on the course that we are uh, doing. It, it will be our third year, third year uh, run for the course. And we are uh, planning for what specific uh, outcome measure tool we will be initiating. Uh, it mentioned in the article also the pre and post test the type of study design that uh, that is really uh, doing to check for the effectiveness. And I also uh, um, agree that uh, it incorporated there the discipline-specific accreditation standards because I think that is one of the major reference that why we push to integrate or include the IPE in the curriculum of the health science program because if there's no... Uh, um, this kind of standards, we will not be doing this kind of course for our health science program. 
that will be all. Johan, thank you. If it's not required, we're not going to do it. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> and, you know, our our dream for the IPE team in the USC, our dream is to uh, invite other health science program, not only in the field of the rehabilitation. We wanted to invite the College of Nursing, Pharmacy, so that we will be able to to spread and be able to improve the competency level of the students. Uh, if my, I may share one of the experience of the students in doing the virtual rehabilitation because we intend them, they are they a are group of uh, students in, 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 four, in four different programs. They examine the patient virtually, uh, they interview the patient, and then after that, we provide them a series of consultation. And that's the mo I, I do agree with Dr. Maureen. It's difficult for a facilitator to keep their mouth shut and listen and observe to the to the discussion of your students. But it takes time for us to develop this kind of skill as a facilitator. We listen to them. And I think the one of the challenges of the students, because they started working silos, they don't know how to integrate their plan. They don't know how to formulate a, a whole program that incorporate the four disciplines if necessary. But later on, they appreciate they were able to understand their roles and their responsibility. They're able to uh, identify the overlapping of the roles and be able to formulate or be able to come up with a solution with that kind of overlapping uh roles and responsibility given a case or a scenario or a rather a case for that particular patient. Uh, that's what one of my sharing in one of the activity or learning activities in our institution. I wanted to add to that. There's some great comments there too. Again, uh, thank you. I think one of the things that we found in, that came from the conceptual framework, and I think this will help guide the University of the Philippines is quantitative versus qualitative. Um, there are quantitative studies, but the, I think the qualitative studies are just as it. So really having good reflective questions, the lived experience of the participant. So what Dr. Mo and I have done is we've created prompting questions based on the IPEC course subcompetencies, and we've turned them into, based on Bloom's level, if it's a early level, middle level, or advanced level, you just change the verb, you know, um, describe here or um uh, create an idea that shows values ethics. That would be great data for you to, on top of the quant data. So we we actually get both. We're getting quantitative and qualitative data from the student experience. So we can see how they're improving, but we're also getting their ideas. So I think, and for for Dr. Mo and I, myself, we have come from different um, PhD focuses. Dr. Mo did her PhD with debriefing and simulation, but was a qualitative study. And mine was a quantitative study on interprofessional education and simulation. And so that, you know, if anyone wants to reach out to us for our various perspectives, I think that's another compliment to this narrative review. We've kind of gotten both those different uh, perspectives in this narrative review because of our experience and our PhD interests. One thing that we did learn with the pre and post that they come in the very first day of the term and they do a pre-assessment and we call it an assignment and give them 10 points. So uh, it, we have it embedded into our computer system, our LMS, so that they think, oh, I have to do this to get points. But it's really a very low point value for their grade, very low, like 0 0.001. But Otherwise, they don't do it and we don't have good data. And because, you, you know, you ha if you're going to do a survey pre-post, you need at least 100, right? And then then it's publishable. Then it can kind of transfer over to your population. And so we do our things. And then at the end, again, it's another assignment that they have to do. So uh, when we had it, just a paper survey, if they volunteer, um, we're actually using that for our pilot study because we got very low numbers. So we're doing a pilot of the model and then we'll be doing the effectiveness of it. You know, the, the pilot study showed us the feasibility to do a larger study. Mm -hmm. And that, so we're hoping to get both of those published out um, by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, we're, we're at the end of our show. I, I, we've discussed a lot, not just about your, uh, your study, but beyond 
your research as well and sharing your experiences in um, interprofessional education and, and collaborative uh, core competencies. And I would like to thank, uh, again, Dr. Belieza and, and Dr. Johnson and, and Giselle for uh, coming into the podcast and, and sharing your experiences and and uh, your uh, your expertise uh, so that our audience may learn from our conversation. Again, uh, if every uh, for everyone who's watching or listening to the podcast and you want to read more about uh, the the study that uh, we're talking about, it's still it's available in uh, the Philippine Journal of Physical Therapy, Volume Two, Issue Two. The title is Designing a Conceptual Framework to Align Learning Objectives to the Interprofessional Education Collaborative Core Competency, uh, a Narrative Review. <laughs> Such a long, uh, long title. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you again, everyone, for being in the podcast. So um, until next time, stay curious and keep exploring the fascinating world of research with us in Behind the Research. See you again, everyone. Thank you.